Shabbat Shalom, Holy Angel of the Most High. Om Shabbat Shalom, I sense your presence. I sense your presence. And thank you for joining me here on The Code Connection. My name is Jesse on Nichols George, and I'm your hostess. The music you were listening to at the beginning of the show is called I Sense Your Presence. It's by Shemshai, and deep appreciation to them for letting me use their music for, geez, it's been the last three and a half <laughs> years, I think it's been, that uh, I've been running this show. So if you want to catch up with more of their music, some of their most current music, you can certainly do so at www.shemshai.com. That's S-H-I-M-S-H-A-I.com. And I want to send a big welcome to everyone because, you know, uh, we have a great show that we run here and I know that some people come back week after week, they're listening in, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm learning so much, I love what you do here. And then sometimes we have a topic or a guest coming on and people go, wow, that looks really interesting. They're just joining in for the first time. So whatever your situation is, it's really great to have you here. We do stream live in three additional places. And that would be Talk Stream Live, Stream Finder, and Penn, known as Parent Counters Network. And I welcome everybody listening to those channels as well, in addition to those that are catching our archives through iTunes, TuneIn.com, and through my website, or my, not my website, <laughs> my YouTube channel. So we have lots of options for people to catch the shows um, at their convenience as well and to, to re-listen to them because sometimes you like to go back and listen to something so that you can catch more information on it or listen a little more intently at times. So that's really great to do. During this show, what I do is I look at living a more compassionate life by aligning with your personal life code. And at times, like today, I do have guests on the show so that you can learn more about their work and other things that may be an option for your code energy. And then I also highlight different musical artists from time to time along the way. Um, oftentimes it's the turning point of the year, like the equinoxes and the solstices. And then also we delve into a variety of different topics, tools, resources, thoughts that allow for you to get some personal exploration, universal insights, and expanding your perception of how life and the world works. What I do is I'm a coding interpreter, and I interpret a person's life codes to allow them to live a life filled with compassion, looking at their individual blueprint in this incarnation and how their energy flows and vibrates in the world. I've created the Genesis Clearing Statement, and uh, that's always something you can catch up where other people have interviewed me. And I've uh, authored four books along the way called You, Me, Life, Dreams, and this companion workbook that's all about relationships and also Activating Compassion in this companion workbook, which um, is all about living that life that you want to live and how to bring compassion into your everyday life. In addition, I am also a collaborator on a fifth book called Embraced by the Divine, The Emerging Women's Gateway to Power, Passion, and Purpose. I've also created the True North Tour, which is a multi-state nationwide tour, including workshops, retreats, seminars, book signings, and all kinds of various events coming up along the way. I have some new things I'm getting ready to integrate in 2017, so you'll want to watch for that. I know I've been laying low in 2016, but <laughs> I'm doing a lot of reworking things right now this year, and it's been really great for that, and I'm really excited about what I'm going to be bringing out as well. So um, we'll look forward to that. I do greatly appreciate all of those that share my shows here, because when you do, you are literally changing lives. And just by clicking that share button, a life can be transformed through the information and the experiences that we share here. And they can always listen to it in our archives by coming into the same link that you use to get into our live show and then listen to it at their convenience. And again, you know, they can catch it at iTunes, TuneIn.com, my YouTube channel, all kinds of options for catching the show. Now, before we get started uh, on everything today, and, and we are waiting a little bit here for our guests to, to pop into the network, so I have somebody working on contacting our guest today, um, and seeing if we can we can get hold of him. So I imagine there's just been a little catch, and we're going to hope for the best uh, that everything's okay with him, which I'm sure it is. Um, and then uh, we'll keep trying to reach him in the meantime, because <laughs> he is excellent. I've had him on my show actually it was about three years ago, and he is just a blessing 
wealth of information to have on the show. So it's going to be incredible to have him here once he pops into the switchboard. In the meantime, we're going to keep carrying on with what we normally do here on the show, and that is to delve into the book by Yehuda Berg, The 72 Names of God, which is actually also what our show is based on today and what we're going to be delving into a little more deeply. Um, we've oftentimes delved into this week to week, but on just by turning the page each week, I delve into it and um, open it up and see what the message is for the week, and then I post it on my page of the Main Street Universe tab on my website, which, by the way, is Jesse and Nichols George, the number one dot com. That's going to get shifted soon, but I'll let you know when it's actually shifted over, so you can also make that adjustment. And the old website link is going to stay active anyway, so we're all good that way. So this week, the name of God that we have at play that we're delving into particularly is called Absolute Certainty. And it's ironic that this one would come up (laughs) while I'm waiting for my guests to jump into the switchboard right now. So Absolute Certainty, and and Yehuda gives this little message at the beginning, which is there's only one way to render all tools and power in this book inoperative and worthless. It is called uncertainty. And the insight he goes on to give is dictionary entry. Uncertainty, principle, nouns. And one, a principle in quantum mechanics holding the increase in the accuracy of measurement of one observable quantity increases the uncertainty with which other quantities may be known. Developed by theoretical physicist Werner Heisenberg in 1927. Two, part of the present scientific view of the nature of physical reality with implications for philosophy. Oh boy, I'm going to tongue twi- tongue <laughs> my tongue twisted today. With implications for philosophy in general. If we inject doubt into any aspect of these teachings, we literally pull the plug and shut them down. I'll believe it when I see it, must be replaced by I'll see it when I believe in it. And remember, certainty is not just confidence that we will get when, what we want to get. But certainty also means recognizing that we're already getting what we need for spiritual growth. And I'll tell you, that's a big piece that he's bringing up in this because I've been there. And when you get to that point where you can really see that you already have it, that you're not really searching for something, you're not trying to get something new, per se, but it's already there, you just got to connect with it, that's, that's a huge piece of bringing the certainty out. And it's true that when hardship strikes, doubts begin to surface in our minds. We become uncertain about the reality of the creator. We question the justice in the universe. We fear for the future. We point the finger of blame at others or toward the heavens. But when we invoke the power of certainty, all these negative sensations fade away like fog shrouding a steadfast mountain. In every area of life, The duration of chaos and pain is always directly proportional to our own degree of certainty and responsibility. Really a big piece this week. Really, really huge. And it's funny, I find, okay, amusing, that I would get this particular name come up this week because I'm on the road for two months (laughs) after being landed in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, for the last 10 months, and uh, actually 11 months. And so it's very interesting to get this piece of certainty that comes up as I hit the road with all of these uncertain factors going on in my life. (laughs) So I love how it always applies. And then meditation that he gets on this is certainty, certitude, conviction, sureness, trust. All these fill your heart through meditation upon the thing. Pretty powerful message from Yehudaberg this week. Now, a little insight to get us going into the topic today and into what we're going to be discussing today. What names do you use when connecting with spirit, the divine, God? And there are so many different thoughts and belief systems, preferences as we begin to get into this one. However, this week, I'm focusing on those names that come to us through the Kabbalah system. For quite a while now, I've been working with a book titled The 72 Names of God, which is by Yehuda Berg, who is a Kabbalah master, which I was just delving into here. 
And in this book, he addresses 72 key things that we deal with in life. And the 72 names that we can use to call upon to assist us in those areas. It is a journey of life that is not only founded in this belief system, but one that so many of us can relate to. One of the things that I love in this work is the way that he offers us common names that are relatable no matter what our spiritual practices or belief systems are. Now, some people may wonder really what the value may be in these thoughts and practices of calling upon these names. And the key here might be described as conscious connection. This is where we take the time to stop and focus, call on assistance from that divine source or spirit self or God or any other name you may choose to use. And what I have found is that as we do this, we are opening a gateway of portal or portal of energy in this process. So it's like you're, you know, it's just, it's like that eye of the storm or something <laughs> in there. You know, you're opening this vortex of energy in this process that connects directly to that energy. And it is a means for taking our attention off of the problem while still acknowledging it and facing it. So through this, we can have breakthroughs instead of breakdowns. And in this process, we are calling in the light. And this allows us to bring peace and compassion into the situation. And it reminds us of our own spirit self and to stand in that energy when faced with various bumps in the road that we encounter in human existence. For some, this is also another way of calling on angelic assistance, as there are also angels that correspond with each of these names. So to call loving light into any situation in our life is to consciously choose to transform the situation at hand and to lift ourselves out of the heaviness that keeps us stuck in these situations. Dr. Robert Newton is one person that actively engages this energy in his work and is sharing it with others. For him, these names are also pathways to God, a guiding light to remain focused and centered in any situation. It is a journey and an exploration that opens many doors to a life that allows us to find the blessings in what we are experiencing. Now, in some ways, you can say that these names are like a lifeline or calling AAA when your car breaks down or calling on the repairman to fix something that is not working for you or going to the mechanic when your car is needing repairs or maintenance. In this case, however, you are calling on that divine presence that many call God to assist you in adjusting the situation and assisting you to get out of the ditch you have fallen into. How often do you call on divine source to assist you with daily life and challenges? And are you trying to solve everything yourself or staying stuck inside instead of calling on expert help to bring you back into the flow of the life? Pretty powerful thoughts to think about here before we go on break. And it gives you a little something to ponder. Because so many times we say, oh, I'm so connected, I'm so connected. And yet we don't do that conscious connection on a daily basis. We turn around and say, I don't have 15 minutes to meditate or things like that. So this is going to be an important show today. And I know Dr. Newton will be with us soon. See, I'm exercising my certainty. (laughs) And we're going to get him on the air. And again, we're going to uh, double check that there. Now, we do have our code energy message for this week as well before we go on break, and that'll take just a moment. This also gets posted, by the way, on my page of the Main Street Universe tab on my website, Jesse Ann Nichols George, the number one dot com. And the code energy for this week is all about second chances, emerging out of trials and tribulations, receiving assistance from others, and creating a stronger and more aligned future for yourself. What you set in motion, your approach to things, and taking the opportunity to do things differently than in the past is what will set the path that you will walk. This is your opportunity to operate with wisdom and create genuine and lasting success for yourself where you have fallen short in the past. You can now rise and be quite strong. Others with influence are likely to step forward and offer assistance or help you achieve greater success. You will likely find out who is really watching out for you during this time. And I want to jump back for just a minute because 
I didn't give the formal name of the the name of God that we're working with this week. The common name was Absolute Certainty, and the formal name is I am Resh Yud. So if you want to ponder on that formal name or even the common name while we go on break, you can do that and draw in some of that certainty as well as we get started here. I am Resh Yud. I'm going to take a short break, and when we return, we will be talking about the 72 names of God. And the song I have for you during our break is called A Walk in Stepping Forth, just by Claire Hedin. And if you'd like to find out more about Claire's work, check out what she's doing, events that she has going on, you can do that through her website as well, www.clairehedin.com, C-L-A-R-E-H-E-D-I-N.com. We'll be back in just a few minutes. to show up, but we are going to proceed on anyways, and we're going to start to work on some of the intro 
for uh, today's guest, Dr. Robert Newton. Again, I do have somebody in the process of trying to reach him right now as well. Um, certainly, we're hoping everything is okay with him. It's not like him at all <laughs> to even be running late. Usually, he's early and I'm completely here, ready to go, full of energy. So. Um, we're seeing what we can do to get through, and I'm sure he's just had a little delay in the process of, of getting into us today, and um, so we will just hold this space for him and open up, and in the meantime, what I'm going to do is share a little bit about who he is, because as I mentioned, I had him on the show three years ago, and um, man, this is a person full of knowledge with so much incredible, interesting background in what he does, and uh, that his name is Dr. Robert J. Newton who has a BA in speech and English and studies include general semantics, linguistics, syllogistic logic, and English composition. Dr. Robert Newton graduated from American College of Law with a Juris Doctorate, has an award-winning landscape and design company, was a certified channel of the Tibetan Foundation, and has certifications in etheric healing, Reiki, sound signature healing, magnetic acupuncture, theta healing, and light speed learning, among others, and work as a Christian science healer. Dr. Dr. Newton also has a doctorate in naturopathic medicine and has authored several books, including Pathways to God. He is a third degree Asclepiad and has been initiated into the highest levels of Kriya Kundalini Yoga, Dr. Newton has also healed many maladies, including cancer, AIDS, and Crohn's disease, and has avidly pursued the study of metaphysics and the spiritual sciences, including Christian science, religious science, science of mind, theosophy, Rosicrucian, Rosicrucianism, <laughs> Buddhism, Hinduism, ancient hermetic teachings from Egypt and Greece, Mayan codiciles, um, also known as, I think, or no, wait, this is a different one, Kudoshka, uh, which is Native American, the Keys of Enos, Tai Chi Kwan, and the Kabbalah and Kriya Kundalini Yoga. Okay. <laughs> Was that a big list of things that I didn't even get to them all of what he does and is about and everything like that? So it's huge, let me tell you that. You can definitely learn more about his work, by the way, at his website, www drrobertnewton.com. So this is a really big thing, and I'm looking forward to, you know, again, having him jump in here, and I'm thinking there's just been a little bit of a delay with him getting into things. But our show today is um, focused on the 72 names of God, which is, in some ways, as I was mentioning, pathways. They're, they're opening to our connection with God. There are understanding of how that energy and flow works. And, um, you know, it's amazing. It's really fun because when I communicate with, with Robert, he, uh, or I should say Dr. Newton, he really is, he's really fun because he's always throwing these little names out. And he knows I work with this book. <laughs> and so he's always throwing the formal names out. And it's like, I don't have them all memorized in my head like he does as though I have to stop and look them up, and then i got to come up with my response, <laughs> and then i got to jump back in there. But I want to give you a little bit of thing, because when I had him on three years ago, basically what he had out was Pathways to God, and totally revised his website. In the meantime, he's, he's put out all of these other um, books that have come out and really, really opened a lot of doors with this, and he's got his own radio show and um, everything like this, but this particular book that he put out regarding the 72 names of God, he calls the hidden codes of God. And he calls them the hidden codes. I, you know, we'll have to delve into why he calls them the hidden codes, but oftentimes they can be referred to this because they come through these common names. They come through some of these common terminologies. And so um, they're, they're something that has to be unfolded and um, uncovered, so to say, um, delved into, and uh, they are um, the keys, as, the, as we would say, the keys that unlock these things. Um, in this book, this new book, and uh, I'm going to share a little bit with you about this, um, The Hidden Codes of God, it's a gripping and potent lesson about life and life, about the life-changing power, I should say, of the divine. 
and the transformational enlightening properties of love. And I remember, I think, I think when I had him on the show before, being that I delved into this, <laughs> he was really like, I've got to do something with this. I've got to do something with this. So it's very cool to see him having done this. Um, the book is about how to see and understand the perfect creation manifested by God and the ways and means to perceive and live in this state of bliss and happiness. It is about finding ways and means that tune us into God and thus elicit a state of happiness. But it's also about keeping an open mind and and, and an inquiring mind so as to remain in a state of extended learning and transformation. So like really everything in life, it's not, you know, on one hand, we've already mastered it all, and on another hand, there's nothing to master. You know, we're always growing and developing it and exploring new layers and new insights on it and transforming through it. And I can tell you myself, I've been using this book since I first started doing a radio show, and I'm constantly unfolding new layers and seeing new pieces. And, and I've done that with all of my studies where I've gone back and I've re-looked at something, and I'm like, wow, there's something really, really powerful in this piece. There's something really, really amazing in this piece. And it's so incredible to do that. Um, now, this book is published, by the way, by Page Publishing, and he does this book in an interesting manner because he does it in the sense of fiction, and he does it through a story with a character named Jane that uh, had a lot of questions that couldn't be answered by his parents or teachers or preachers or the people around him or his peers, and yet he has this intense questing to gain knowledge and intense desire to want to understand the most complicated things <laughs> in the universe. I have a feeling this probably parallels Dr. Robert Newton's life. <laughs> I have a feeling that this is, is kind of based on him in a lot of ways because knowing what I know about him, uh, he, I think he's always had that unquenchable thirst in a way or always that desire to keep delving into knowledge. And he, you know, as a result, this character in his book causes friction with his family and his teachers and um, and it kind of makes him an outcast in society and until he comes into the science of Christian, Christianity. And and then he goes on to share with us that, you know, in his high school years, James begins to uncover all these answers to lifelong questions that have always evaded him or eluded him and, um, you know, within the science of Christianity where he couldn't get the explanations. And, and so he continues to pursue and pursue and pursue until he starts to understand these deep complexities of life, and that leads him to an esoteric and um, what he refers to as an erotically eye-opening journey in which he discovers these hidden codes of God, um, which Yehuda Berg calls the 72 names of God. And Jane's uh, encounter, his, his, his uh, character in the book, it, his encounters with society unwillingness to listen and to accept what he's learned. And I think that this is such an interesting parallel as we go through life because, you know, how many times when we start on the spiritual path, people don't want to talk about these things with us. They don't want to open the doors with us. They, you know, um, it, we start to see that separation, right? There are people that start to fall away from our life because they can't, relate to us anymore. They're kind of like, well, who is this person that's <laughs> on this deep spiritual journey and who's this person that's, you know, doing all of these things here and opening all of these eyes? And, and um, so, you know, I think that's something that many of us start to feel like. We start to feel a little outcast and, and it takes a little time to find that new adjustment or that new space of, of adapting into what we're opening to. And so, uh, you know, many times we hit these blocks where people, they don't want to listen, they don't want to hear, and they don't want to accept what we're learning. They don't want to open themselves up to the concepts, which actually are very universal concepts. They're not locked into one little piece. And um, so, you know, that's really cool. So James encounters with society and their unwillingness to learn about the energy of love and the multidimensional universe wherein it exists. And this causes 
um, you know, a lot of, as I was mentioning, failed relationships, particularly romance. Romance will lose him until he reconnects with this former soulmate. And that soulmate not only understands him, but totally accepts him for what he's discovered. Um, but it's someone who desires now to accompany him in this quest. And as an adult, James owns and operates this award-winning landscaping business. So you can see this is really based on him. <laughs> it's written as fiction, but it's really an autobiography style fiction, if you want to say that. And ultimately, he comes to the conclusion that regardless of how they may be received, that the codes that have been revealed to him need to be shared in this world. And I have to agree. These codes are powerful keys. They are amazing keys to what is happening and what is going on in the world. And, um, you know, this is, this is very powerful. And I, I did get a message that we do have a connection. I do see um, Dr. Newton in the switchboard here. So we're excited to welcome him on. And, you know, actually great timing in a way. I'm going to open up his mic here. But, you know, great timing because, as most people know, I take almost this amount of time anyways. <laughs> so I just got to do a little extra introduction on him today. Dr. Newton, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. I've been doing some extended um, introductions about your book, uh, The Hidden oh, I God, and about you. <laughs> I I apologize. I just teleported in from another dimension, so <laughs> I got mixed up on the time zone. So I remember when you were in Utah, and uh, so um, anyway, uh, yeah, I'm glad to be on the show. And I've actually been thinking about the 72 names of God a lot. It seems like I can't hardly do anything. I can't hardly write, and I can't hardly speak without talking about them. So. Um, <laughs> They are kind of like the secret code that's not all that secret. And then there's this other things that I was fortunate enough to meet. Uh, Lee Ross, uh, who is of uh, the uh, www.tools.net. And he taught me uh, how to use the numbers to find a lot more meaning in the words and to find covalent or similar words that, that, give more meaning into all of this stuff. So that, that's kind of like exciting. But I've been doing like the 72 names of God for like, I guess about six or seven years, maybe eight years or something like that. Well, it's it's powerful. And I, I remember years ago when you were on the show about three years ago, that it really was, there was a little spark going off in you at that time because you were so excited I used them on the show. And then... <laughs> Yeah, I was. <laughs> and, and, and I could, I could feel and hear your head ticking, <laughs> and it was like boom, 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 boom. I could see all the pieces clicking together for you at that time, and and uh, you know what you were gonna do, and and it, it just, and I've been in that space that you've been into. I get enveloped in something, and then it's like, oh my gosh, where did the time go, or you know, where did this unfold? But I'm hoping that maybe you can give us a little bit of background because you have this amazing wealth of knowledge and information and, you know, it's, like I said, it's so exciting to have you here. But give us a little background about how did these names come about? Well, that's interesting because um, some of the people I've had on my show, including Orion Moya, who was, who was studying the uh, Zachariah Sitchin stuff, his dad was teaching it to him since he was three years old. Kind of, kind of sounds like what I was doing with my son. I was teaching him at a young age, too. But uh, he's very, very knowledgeable about the Sumerians or the Anunnaki, the ancient race that was there that Sitchin, Zach, uh, the, Sitchin talks about in his 12 books, including the 12th planet and when time began. But there's like 10 other books. I think another one was the Earth uh, Chronicles Expedition. But that was on a slightly that wasn't on the Anunnaki itself, but he was going in and looking at megalithic structures in the Middle East right there. And it's kind of astonishing about what he found. But what what uh, what I would ask Orion, I said, I said, so this is from the Torah, but it seems like to me that the characters in the Torah, that they were talking about these people with these extended lifespans actually – uh, coincide with the Anunnaki lifespans, which were hundreds of years at a time. So I counted, I think, when I was 
writing in search of the body of mortal or the upcoming immortality prophecy, which is almost done really close. Um, I counted 13 people in the Bible that lived to 900 years or more and another one that was like 800 years. So, so Moses was definitely one of those. Noah was one of those people too, but there were a lot of other people that lived there. So I kind of took that and I go, well, wait a minute, there's something going on. So I asked Orion, I said, do you think, do you think that these 72 names of God are from the, from the Anunnaki, the Sumerians? And he said, oh yeah, absolutely. And I asked one other expert in this field too. Um, I think it was Sasha, Dr. Sasha Alex Leffen, Lesson, and I think he agreed with me too. So they're, you know, they're obviously they're super old names, and you know, I bet you would agree with me that there's not, there's not any, there's not any situation where you can't go find a name on that chart, and that it will help you. So it's not only the name though; it's the cymatic vibration be, behind the behind the Hebrew language. There's two languages. Well, there's actually three languages that are like that. There's Hebrew. There's um, Sanskrit, which I'm some I know a lot about. And there's also the Egyptian hieroglyphs. There's a language I've been told that's associated with that. Unfortunately, we don't have a codex to. Yeah, and <laughs> it'll show up eventually to to determine that. So I found on the Internet, and I think if you Google cymatic forms of the 72 names of God, it will come up, and it basically shows the the, the geometric forms that these, these Hebrew letters create, and also the Sanskrit letters also create. And there's, we're going to have a picture of that in – the immortality prophecy coming out hopefully in a week or two. It was supposed to have been out already, but, you know, I can't get upset. It's such a complicated book and it's so much work for my editor rather than get upset with her for not having it on time. I'll use, use Resh Hayin, which is finding the good and the bad. So I'm sure I'll, I'll see why it didn't come out sooner. Um, I don't know. What, 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 do you, what do you think about that and, and the timelines involved with that? So the, the, the Anunnaki were like at least 400,000 years ago, maybe 450, and are, are maybe actually even still here. I, I, I'm pretty sure they do have people that are still here. Well, I think it's very interesting because, um, you know, all of this coming out, and I'm seeing more and more connections with this come out, but with the timing of, of this new book coming out, it's actually better for it to be postponed because we're on that waning moon right now. And I think it's probably <laughs> yeah. really going to have that advantage of the, the new moon energy and the waxing moon energy to, well, you know, you to go. have that. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. in In action. you go. And then, um, so. and, and so there's, uh, these different these different pieces, and of course, the common name that we find with Resh Hayin is Diamond in the Rough, which we just addressed a few weeks ago uh, on the show here when I opened up. But I love that you're making this connection to the Anunnaki and the Lemurians. Um, you know that really triggered well, me think, when, when you said the Lemurians. It, well, it really I think I think they're in my book Beyond the Myths of Time and Trees Rule the Earth. Um, I, I, I saw a connection when Lemuria sank, or most of it. I mean, part of it's still there in the Hawaiian islands that are still there and the Tahiti and Samoa and those, those other islands in that region. But it was a huge continent, I believe. I mean, I can't show you. Well, actually, I have seen maps that show it as a huge thing, probably from from Rudolf, maybe Rudolf Steiner or C.W. Leadbeater, these people that were involved with theosophy and other things, they were able to go on these psychic dimensions and 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 do things. And and then even Leadbeater and and I think it was uh, Madame Blavatsky, they diagrammed the atom uh, at least a hundred years before the scientists <laughs> actually showed showed us the structure of an atom. So the ability to go onto these levels. And I, I, I believe I do have the ability, but I also believe anyone has the ability. It's simply, um, it's, it's, it's simply uh, preparing your, relaxing your body so that your mind 
can go into these realms into the alpha theta delta brain waves. And so meditation is a good way to do that, but it's certainly not the only one. You have dancing will do it, singing will do it, whistling will do it, playing an instrument will do it, all these things have actually been demonstrated. I have pictures of a lot of the stuff in this book because I wanted to to show people. I said, I don't want them to trust me. I want them to be able to see for themselves so that they can, so that they can, you know, figure it out themselves. It makes, you know, it makes more sense. Uh, but it, 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 it does seem to me that there were Lemurians that went to Atlantis after Lemuria sank. And so these are very peaceful people. These were very psychic people. These are very intuitive people. I, I, I believe they had a language, but they spent very little time speaking. And the benefit to that is like Yogi Govindan used to always tell me in the Kriya Yoga things I did that talking too much wasted prana. And uh, I, I, I believe that. I preach that. And I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I just I think there is a Lemurian connection, and there's there's definitely it seems like there's a Sumerian Anunnaki connection in Egypt as well as Atlantis and as well as Lemuria. So maybe that's why that was such a highly flourishing culture. And uh, someone that I had on my radio show recently, and I I talked with at some conferences where I've spoken and where he's spoken, Larry Dean Hunter has pushed the timeline and to Egypt back at least uh, to 200 million years ago because, or no, not, excuse me, 20 million years ago because he found a buried temple there and uh, just outside of Giza, I forget what the name of it is, but I'm looking at it in my head right now. It's kind of up on a hill uh, behind the, the, the three great, the Great Pyramid and the other two large pyramids there. And uh, they carbon dated things inside of there 22 million years ago. So, um to me, that's exciting because it validates what I said in my book. So my book was supposed to be fiction, but to me, it was it was truth. It was reality disguised as fiction, but I put it in a fictional setting to make it more digestible to a wider audience. So. Well, I was gonna. I was wondering why you had chosen to write fiction, and I thought I know this is based a lot on your life. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's called the Trojan horse, you know. You come in, you sneak it in. Uh, and and I know you know this because you know a lot about the mind like I do. You know, the subconscious will resist stuff if the stuff goes against the, the prevailing information that's in the, con- the subconscious or the unconscious mind. But when you can prevent it, present it as a story, as the people – that read the book that uh, on Amazon that I've seen them all the five star reviews I've gotten for that particular book they they all they all got it they they got it that I was telling a story but I was actually guiding them <laughs> to something more at least a lot of them did so you know that's that's exciting when people can see that and when they can see that that and and if I just come out and set all this stuff right up front they could have like turned off they could have gone oh. Uh, I'm not going to listen to this. This guy's crazy, you know, but if I can make it a story, oh, this is only a story. And then you start seeing, oh, this guy is actually trying to teach me some stuff beyond a story. Then that's exactly what I was trying to do. Well, the greatest, the greatest lessons in cultures and societies were handed down through telling stories. And we know this as well, that stories were such a great channel to avoid religious persecutions to avoid yeah. uh, problems with the law and the government and things like that. And so people talked in stories, and the stories allowed, as you said, people to uh, be more attentive. They, they became more attentive with the story than uh, just having the information straightly presented. Yeah, that makes completely sense. So, you know, there's, there's many things like that. I, I believe... I think when Homer wrote the Il- Iliad and the Odyssey, I believe it was supposed to. I think I believe it was presented as as fiction, but from what I can tell, it actually really happened. From from what I can tell, is those supposedly those 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 Greek gods of mythology weren't a myth at all, but they were actually um, of extraterrestrial origin and. And uh, they talk about them being on Mount Olympus, or maybe they were in spaceships above Mount Olympus. It's 
that's what some people have thrown out there, and I don't find it all all that crazy. But then I also operate with, uh, I try to keep my mind completely open, and I find that it allows me to learn at, uh, at a speed that's incredible, something because because I'm not discounting this stuff. If I think it's crazy, I'll go, well, I'm just going to file that away, and I'm going to start looking around. And a lot of times things that I thought originally were crazy, like like in Dr. Hertak's book, The Keys of Enoch, where he talks about there being a computer in the center of the cosmos where all information is stored. Now it makes sense because I've got another information that 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 talks about our DNA being computer codes, and I'm going, well, okay, there's a synchronicity right there. There's there, there's a link to it. And then they're finding other things that uh, they're even finding uh, uh, ancient computers in some of these caves and things like that. So um, it, 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 if, if, you, if, if, if you say, well, this is hard for me to understand, but if you, if you say, but, but there might be some truth in it, if you, if you allow that, to keep that door open, it allows you almost, almost invariably, if you allow it, things will come into your life and they'll show you, uh, you'll, you'll be giving the other pieces that will allow you to, to, to take the original idea, which you thought was crazy, and then you put it together with the other one, and then it starts making sense. Well, that makes complete sense to me. <laughs> but I yeah, let's get sensible here. <laughs> so, you know, I look at codes and other people go, I don't know how you're getting what you're getting. But, you know, because I put it in the terms of codes and when I do that, I it makes my mind possible because I, you know, in my mind, what I see in codes shares the truth. It removes the judgment. It removes the the polar opposite, so to say, and it just shows us the essence of what we're dealing with. And and when we can get around some of those things, which I know is true in the 72 names of God as well, it's not so much this black and white, right or wrong thing, as it is, it's a concept, it's an aspect of life, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a piece of truth of how things function. And that seems to absorb in, and as you say, I know from doing these various works, whether, you know, working with 72 names of God, but then also unfolding my own realm of codes, that the acceleration in learning, the acceleration in in development is incredible once you start down these roads. Yeah, I agree with you. And I I, I like how you said that there, that maybe, you know, that there's, 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 Maybe there is really no bad, at, and there, uh, I, I'm I'm getting toward that point myself. And it comes from using that name Rush A I N. If you find the good and the bad, well, maybe there isn't any bad. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's that's like a that's that that's to me that's something that's been set up. That's a dichotomy that's been artificially set up. Now, in 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 Taoism and Tai Chi, you have the yin and the yang. But they call it, you know, the plus and the minus or the the masculine and the feminine. Okay, that's all groovy and all of that because you need a plus and a minus to create electricity, which is prana, which is exactly uh, what sustains our bodies. Probably in in my new and and the and search of the body immortal. I talk about that. And I did that as a novel on immortality. And then my editor said, well, you should write this book on, uh, you should write a nonfiction book on this subject. And as I did that, you know, I started getting all kinds of other insights that I completely missed when I was, when I, when I was doing the, the novel version uh, of this. So it's, um, uh, I, you know, if, I believe that the the prevailing theologies, the church has set all this stuff up because, you know, you have more of a a good and evil concept in the Old Testament or the Torah and the New Testament. But in the Nag Hammadi documents that they found in Nag Hammadi, Egypt, which are also known as the Gnostic texts, man, you you get a whole different thing. They're not focused on sin. They're not focused on good and bad. They're focused on building the light factor in the body. And that's what I use kind of as, as a, as a rough outline 
I didn't even write it down, but this is kind of the premise I was working on. If we can get more more light into the body, and even Jesus himself in First John and in John also has some references where he talks about you are children of the light. Well, why is he just saying that, or, or does it actually mean something to me? It means something. But most people, when they read that, they completely miss it because they're working from a they're working from a good bad construct versus uh, versus light enlightened construct. And when you get into that, then it then you don't have to worry. Well, am I good or am I bad? Because you know the seventh name of God that I say all the time too is I love cup I love, which is restoring things to the perfect state and to me, that implies things were always in a perfect state. How can you restore something to a perfect state if it didn't start out perfect? So. Exactly. And, you know, these are these are big pieces that we forget. We forget about the distortions that are going on along the way. We forget that, you know, some of these terminology, and, of course, I had a relative that was involved in deciphering or decoding the Bible. Um, he was on the team of 13 that, that did the translations. And, Which version? Um, and, and he talked about the distortions that were being made into, wow. you know, the, trans, <laughs> the, the translated versions. I mean, he left notes about how this was because he was a Hebrew scholar and professor. And, um, you know, he said, oh, no, you know, a lot of it was distorted along the way. And, and twisted, and they'll take terms like the light, for example. And this is where we see a lot of distortions where it then runs rampant through all these different belief systems. And I'm not going to isolate anything out, but, uh, you know, it runs rampant, and then that gets turned around. And instead of being, as you say, the foundational principle of light and energy um, and, and, and two forces working together in harmony, um, it becomes this thing of division and separation and competition, and none of those exist. <laughs> really, they exist, but they don't exist in the light uh, because it's all energy. They're not seen as a competition with each other. Um, and then, and then, of course, you've got the groups that dis- distort it again and say, "Well, you know, children of the light. That's children of Lucifer," versus uh, which means yeah, the light. which is light. It's interesting how yes. Lucifer, you know, I tell people, they say, oh, Lucifer is a fallen angel. I go, <laughs> a bunch of crap. I said, Lucifer means light. That means, loose means light in Spanish. L-U-C, Luke, or loose French means uh, light. And I think in, uh, in, 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 in Latin, it's L-U-C, it also means night. So that's the base language Latin that, French and, and and Spanish and Italian came from, and and I, I guess it seems like there was um, a, a, a deliberate changing of the things. And it's, I'm really happy that you shared that with me because people look at me like, well, how can you how can you know this? Now I can say, well, I actually know someone who has a relative that that worked on the translation. And they saw how things were being changed. So the word sin doesn't mean evil, at least not when the Bible was written, it didn't. When the Torah was written, it meant misguided, to miss, to miss a point. So <laughs> to me, it, it, I can note that with ignorance. And, and ignorance is not something that's inherently bad. It just means a lack of knowledge or a lack of understanding of something. And, and that changes the whole thing. But whole religions have been built around uh, around uh, specifically uh, Islam and Christianity and even Judaism have been built around this good and bad stuff. But <laughs> um, evil, uh, sin and evil and things like that. And I think that was a control mechanism to keep us controlled, to keep us compliant and pliable with with, with authorities that benefited from us being ignorant of what this, what the things really meant. I, I mean, that's kind of that's kind of like the whole aspect of us receiving a programming that to be without a lot of money, to not have a mansion and you know five 
vacation properties and whatever else is suffering. <laughs> and, you know, as we learn suffering is a state of mind, we can go through a lot of things in our lives. And people who have been following my journey know that I've been through a lot of things, particularly in the last 10 months, in the last two years. And for me, none of it was suffering because, you know, people could say, well, don't you think trying to survive in minus 30 and minus 40 degrees in your vehicle is suffering? And I'm like, no, it was an experience. And when you're at that point that you say, if this is my time to go, then I release myself fully. And, you know, and when you understand yourself, there is no, there is no suffering except for if we're living by somebody's standards outside of ourselves, outside of our truth, um, in there. And so, you know, you talk about a love cost a lot. When you understand this wholeness that you are, uh, what's interesting is that that's coded with all master number sequences. And when yeah. we look at how those sequences come together, it comes together in what we, we understand is a, a perfection. Uh, no ending, no beginning, a full circle, a full resonance. And um, so, <laughs> you know. Well, there's also, there. there's, also, there's also an angel I found that is, is associated with that name. It's either Hakiel or Ankiel. I'm trying to, I might have mixed that between that. One of them is uh, Aleph Kap Aleph, and I think the other is Havresh Chet. But. It's it's interesting and I kind of just ran across this stuff accidentally. Uh, it's amazing what you can learn from a search engine and how uh, you know the things. Sometimes you're looking for you don't exactly find, but you find something better than you weren't looking for. It's kind of like these people that work in the realm of chemistry. Almost every discovery was found by mistake. They almost never find anything deliberately. <laughs> they, they find something else from what they created, and it has value, but it wasn't what they were attempting to create. Uh, <laughs> so, it, well, that, it, that happens kinda, a lot. How many, of us, how many of us go on that journey to start to research something, and then we we end up down a completely different path, right? <laughs> yeah, every day. Every day it happens to me because – I'm looking at all the things that called up, and it's not exactly what I wanted. So I'm getting slightly irritated because I'm thinking, well, why can't it give me what I want? Because I put specifically what I want, and then I just I start looking around, and then I start actually finding, I start finding the, the answer like in another in in another way. So again, it's like it's like keeping open. It's not it, it's it's not being locked in that that there's only one way you can find it because. If there was only one way you could find things, then I wouldn't know very much right now. <laughs> I wouldn't know very much right now. <laughs> but and I think what you're mentioning too, Dr. Newton, is this concept of if we're willing to be open to see what's being presented to us as opposed to just what our mind is set on accessing, uh, we can really gain some incredible pieces there. Um, yeah, well, our, our minds are limited by our minds are limited by the programming in there. So it's it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a constant goal to keep reprogramming and get the stuff out there that doesn't serve us. That's why I wrote uh, the book of Map to Healing in Your Essential Divinity Through Theta Consciousness. I'm actually going through that book right now and updating it and re-editing it since my my publisher at that time, Balboa Press, did such a horrible job. I decided that the information in the book should have a wider audience. And I, I heard people's objections, and I agreed with them, and so I decided to do something about it. Um, it it's, you know, there's all, you know, there's, there's like theta healing, theta consciousness healing, theta consciousness reprogramming, which I've been involved with. And there's neurolinguistic programming. Uh, there's uh, EFT. There's tapping. There's silver mind control. All of these things can allow you to change the limitations that we're living under, you know, very, very quickly. And then there's another benefit we have. And it's explained in Dr. Dr. Lothar Schaefer's book, In Search of the Let's see, In Search of the Divine, the Divine Plan, uh, and that's also available on Amazon. Um, 
where he talks about that there's all the space in the quantum field that's empty and is waiting for someone to come in and create it. So at first I was thinking at this for us as a, as a civilization, and I was talking on my own radio show a couple of days ago, and, and, and I just thought, and then it just flew into my head. I said, why don't you, you know, it's almost like, hey, dumbass, why don't you do this for yourself? <laughs> I'm going, yeah, exactly. I might be a little dumb. Maybe I should wake up and see that we have this possibility. So there's obviously people on this planet that that are in control of things that don't like us, but they're not going to be there forever, and they may not be there much longer. In the interim, we have the ability to go in and create a, a reality that's not their reality where they don't control us anymore and maybe where we begin to control them. And, and I think that's the key is it's so easy for us to engage in this competition, which oftentimes keeps that energy alive, um, can, keeps that control factor alive. But when we get down to the truth and realize we're not in competition, <laughs> and I think that's the key that as that energy shifts over, that it's not about controlling everybody else it's, it, you know, it's not about us all of a sudden taking control as much as it is creating a different energy pattern um, well I know that you've worked with uh, done a lot of counseling with people and, you know, and probably the most prevalent thing that we run into and I run into when I'm working with people is this codependency issue the need to try and control others I find it interesting that the people that are trying the hardest to control someone else are more screwed up than the people that are, in many cases anyway, are more screwed up than the people, well, on, only in a relative sense, more confused. Let's not say screwed up. They're more confused than the people that they want to control. Uh, I, 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 I would ascribe this much to politicians. It's interesting how they pass all these laws. Then they wind up violating the own their, the own laws that they pass. You know, they they well, they want to control us, but they can't seem to control themselves. So right. Um. That's a you know that's a field ripe with possibi- with with things that can be learned from that. So what that basically tells you, you know, is well, uh, we we need to basically just concentrate on us and and let the other person con- concentrate on them. And, uh, you know, I have confidence that people will will eventually find what's most benefit for them, and they'll eventually find what you're talking about, where this concept of competition, it, this kind of annoys me, even though I do like to watch sports, but I see it kind of in a different light than I used to, because, um, it, you know, if someone loses a game by one point, to me, they didn't really lose. They basically played the other team to us. To an to an even game, and it, it should just be more like a, an exhibition than well, I have to beat you to validate myself. See, I don't I don't feel that I have to. If I did that, then I wouldn't be looking at other people's information and things like that. I mean, I'm. Um, it, it's uh, and 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 the operating system on Earth, and it's talked about in 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 great. And, and, and fine detail in Hermes Trismegistus treatise, the Emerald Tablet, or also known as the Smagardine Tablet, where he discussed that which is above, above is that which is below, and that which is below is that which is above for the performance of the miracles of the one thing. I mean, is that beautiful or is that beautiful? I mean, it's 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 basically showing us that the the interconnectedness of things that are, are what allow the miracles. And 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 the, and the great things and the great realizations and the great works where as the the competitive aspect, you know, doesn't work well at all. And you know, in science, you know, you know where the, you know how they're putting they're make they're, they're taking they're taking biology, chemistry, and physics and quantum physics and quantum mechanics, and they're putting them together. And this is how they're seeing much. This is how they're seeing much deeper into what is versus, you know, uh, um, that that they're seeing these things. They're seeing how things are interconnected. Whereas if you stay in one discipline, it limits you. So 
Dr. Bruce Lipton, who's fairly famous for, let's see, what's the name of his book? Uh, yeah, 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 I know it. I'll get it in a minute. He's basically <laughs> taking biology and and mixing it with with physics. Uh, Dr. Schaefer is taking chemistry and mixing it with quantum physics and quantum mechanics. And and um, my, my friend that I'm actually doing a book with right now in Gematria, uh, uh, Lee... Um, Lee Ross, um, you know, he basically, you know, he 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 basically says it's the th- it's the putting things into separate disciplines is is a horrible model of education. It leads to not lowly functioning people, uh, so that everything should actually be thought kind of intertwined together, and and that's kind of like what what Rudolf Steiner was doing and. They kind of do that, I think, in the Cardin schools and the Montessori schools that are based on his um, his teachings and things like that. So um, that's the way I go. I don't know. I could, I could never stay in one discipline anymore. I, I know that I can only get one little slice, but if I go to the other disciplines, I get enough slices to make a whole pie, as it were, <laughs> and then I can <laughs> – <laughs> And then I can have a full meal, as it were, also. <laughs> well, and I th- I think that that's the interesting thing is that, too, as, as we delve into all of this, is and we talk about the interrelatedness, the interrelatedness accepts the differences. And I think that that acceptance and appreciation um, is a big thing. Uh, you know, so many times it's, it's like accepting what is is there before us. You know, we have this this process to go through, and too many times we get locked up in, you know, I'm, I'm fighting this or resisting it or competing against it instead of jumping in and saying, hmm, I wonder what would happen if I worked with this. You know, I don't have to feed that part that, that weighs me down or that doesn't isn't aware or whatever, but uh, you know when I when I accept it, it's getting me to delve a little bit deeper. It's getting me to to open to this new aspect of myself, and I think that that acceptance. I mean, that's talked about a lot of places, and that that's a lot of my work too. In compassion, is being willing to accept. Okay, here's here's what it is. <laughs> And what am I going to do with that? Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I think, I think for myself, I was always, in, in a certain degree, I was always running around and looking at things that other people weren't doing. But I was doing it kind of in a one-discipline type way, and um, the universe operates and reveals itself most fully when. We use that multidisciplinary approach. I mean, so when so when I was five years old, uh, I had this um, I, I had this understanding that when I was being told in the Baptist church by the minister that I was a sinner that I was going to go to hell and I had to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Master, I didn't have any problem with accepting Jesus Christ as a Lord and Master. I didn't have any problem with that, but I had a real big problem with with the idea of, of uh, that I was a sinner. It didn't make any sense to me because I was, and, and that God was going to send me to hell if I didn't repent because I was being taught in Sunday school that God is love. And I think I even, I shared that exact, uh, that exact passage in the, um, on the prophets of the immortality prophecy that I hope is soon out. So, well, it will be soon out. I don't have to hope, but um and 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 then when I found Christian Science when I was like 15 I was like giddy because it verified all the stuff I know and I wasn't getting any support from my parents on this issue from my friends from any other clergy or anything and I even incarnated on planet with two left-handed parents because I wanted them to be able to understand a left-handed me and they hadn't. <laughs> so I went out of my way to set up the things the way I wanted them. But it didn't work out that way because it, I needed to go through that experience so that I could understand things and that I could and it, and it helps me understand 
and explain things better to other people, and it gives me more empathy for people that are like in that state. So I've done, I, I did a talk at the No Fest a few years ago, and some people came up to me afterwards, and because I talked about Christian Science, and the guy said, he said, yeah, he said, um, I kind of hit a wall, and I kind of feel guilty about it, and I said. You don't have to feel guilty at all. I said I hit that same wall, and when I decided to move out and start looking at a whole bunch of things, I, I saw that as much as it helped me for a while, it limited me because I was only in this one thing. I, I couldn't have ever gotten to where I am today if I, I'd stayed there. So, you know, I jumped out of that about 1980, started looking at theosophy, started looking at Buddhism, and started looking at um, – um, you know, different Tai Chi and things like that. And then I went to Egypt and amazing things happened right there. If I'd stayed in that one system, I probably wouldn't have done any of those things. So it's the, it's the ability to, hmm, I'm being told, I'm being told, it's the ability to keep dancing is the ability to keep your mind open. In other words, you keep moving. You don't let things get too solidified inside the body and um and 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 actually dancing and exercise this is kind of off the point but why brought since i brought up the thing of dancing dancing and and exercise and things and yoga are things that are important to do every day that's what i was being told when i was uh writing the immortality prophecy and so i started looking i started looking at some research and then i started thinking okay well, if the atoms that comprise my body, if I'm moving, those atoms are going to move faster. If my body becomes hotter, those atoms are going to move faster. So it makes a lot of sense that I would want to keep the higher energy of of things going by making the atoms, by, by making them work faster. So, you know, all this thing with global warming, everyone's all freaked out about it and 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 I I knew it was a hoax from the beginning, and I found some recent uh, some recent uh, confirmation of that in the book by Michael Hanley called Dark Winter, and he basically supports what Dr. Eben Browning said in 1990 that we'll be going into a mini ice age. But I was just saying I don't care if it gets hotter. I want things to get hotter because I believe that helps us take a third a, a, a planet operating in the third dimension and moving it up into the fourth dimension and even hey let's push it into the fifth dimension because the higher you go in those dimensions the more energy the more the body exhibits its energy characteristics and the more easily the mind and con- uh, the mind is able to absorb information and the more easily uh, we get into those higher brain waves and everything like alpha, but really you want to be in theta and delta if at all possible. So, you know, the exercise can, can precipitate that. The dancing can precipitate that. And it's, uh, it's, it's kind of exciting to see some things that are so simple that can make such a big difference in your life. So I, I've known several yogis who were very vibrant, they would do the yoga asanas, which is this postures and stretching every morning. And as soon as they stop doing it, shortly they after, um, their bodies expired. Uh, the same thing happened for my deceased wife. When she stopped doing that stuff, her body started deteriorating at a rather rapid rate. And this was a highly evolved, uh, this was a highly evolved soul. Now, in her case, she wanted to leave planet Earth and I didn't want her to, but I understood why she wanted to because <laughs> she was getting frustrated <laughs> with the whole level of consciousness right here. Uh, but it's those things are starting to change. It's starting. It's well, it's not only starting. It's it's we're well into the change. It's uh, those changes are were prophesied by Krishna in the Bhagav in the Mahabharata and I think the Bhagavad Gita, like. Uh, like 5,100 years ago, he talked about us at this exact time right now, going into a golden age of 10,000 years. Uh, and the Hopis and the Mayans talking about going into a golden age of 1,000 years. Well, I'd rather take 10,000 years. Heck, I'd actually really rather cons- 
would rather extend it. I, I believe that we could extend it forever. In other words, if things are perfect, as the seventh name of God tells us, and it's, this is even explained in the Upanishads, the Indian texts that talk about thought, and they say that it basically explains that if, if things that look imperfect, this is, this is basically an illusion. This is a distortion of the way things really are. And Plato even talked about these kind of concepts too. So there's no shortage of, of, of disciplines and, and people that have seen this. I don't know who wrote the Upanishads, but my, my feeling is it was probably people not from this planet. That was people highly evolved that were living in a four, probably at least a fourth and not a fifth dimension society or planet or something like that. I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I mean, there's there's a lot of different components there, and I think that comes around to that sort of interrelatedness that many different groups and belief systems have seen kind of the same thing, you know, or a similar thing happening at the same time. And I, I feel like that's where we start to find the truth of things. Um, there is definitely a distortion here, and, and why is that? Well, that's because of the differences in the dimensional um, energy patterns or vibrations that are going on, and um, you know, you talk about your your wife passing on, and and it's, I think there's a lot of people in that state, and I think there's this blend of releasing some of the the weight here on this planet, as well as um, People just being like her, just frustrated, you know, frustrated with the energies that are here. Said, "That's it. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm checking out of here." Um, but I, I find these concepts that you're talking about really interesting. Of uh, the higher in the dimensions that we go, the more we see the characteristics in the body, and I guess that's where it, it, connecting with things like the 72 names of God comes in because it's through those connections that we're able to raise the vibrational energy level or the way the energy is functioning. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, that's kind of interesting. I find it really fascinating too. Um, um, it's just that um, uh, I believe, well, you know, I think it was Rudolf Steiner that talked about, in his book, uh, Atlantis and Lemuria, where he talked about how the people, their body, their bodies were more, more pliable. They didn't get hurt and, and all of these kind of things. And, uh, and I was just thinking, uh, this would make sense because, uh, cause from what I can tell, these people were are so, they were so in tune with God that they had to be living in the higher dimensions. I mean, they were completely peaceful. And they were highly artistic, and artistic expression is uh, often associated, well, it's always associated with those brain waves I keep talking about, which are really, it's more than really a brain wave. Uh, it's more a state of consciousness that the brain wave is kind of like a bioindicator and showing. But it it doesn't matter. For a while, I was all hung up on making the distinction, and I decided not to fight it too much or just little by little throw that out there. But um it's uh a body a, well you know what what we know from tai chi which i've done a lot of and i've taught a lot of people to do the tai chi standing meditation and i of the almost thousand of people that i've taught i've never had anyone that couldn't do it a lot of people thought they couldn't do it and they were astonished how quick they could do it because it's just so easy to do once you once you once you allow the body to relax, then all the good things start happening to you. And your body that's tense, I can show you through kinesiology. I can show you how you're weaker, and I can show you how you're stronger through being relaxed, just through using kinesiology muscle testing. You know, meditation helps to facilitate that and all the other things that I'm talking about in in the body of mortal. When, when the body, you know, you know what they found out? Uh, so and then in the in, in search of the body immortal and in in the immortality prophecy coming up soon 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 <laughs> I'm, pro, I'm programming it as we're on the radio 
<laughs> that uh, when when a body is stressed, uh, not all kinds of bad things start happening. But the worst thing that starts happening is that this telomeres enzyme that actually keeps the telomeres and the chromosomes from wearing out, uh, it stops being produced. So when the body is relaxed, when the body is happy, when the body is in meditation, when the body is in creativity, when the body is in dancing, which is obviously a form of creativity, but I'm just bringing it up to the people that might not um, access it that way, then you know, only then then the body is in a state of rejuvenation, and it and and it should not have to die. So we know, like in the case of the telomeres, after 45 to 50 cell replications, they start they start degenerating, or they stop, they, they or it or it makes bad copies of the cells, and that could also you know it's pretty much been associated with rogue cells, uh, cancerous type cells, and things like that. So just just Thinking of the possibilities that we can have from not getting all stressed out, from from being in in a relaxed state of divinity, and being and 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 it's in this relaxed state that all the psychic abilities come too, because they're in these altered brain waves that are in the state of relaxation, the alpha and the theta, and even the upper delta waves. Well, there's, there's definitely a lot in in all of those brain waves, and I think you know what's interesting is you talked a couple of times about you know the, the Lemurian connection with these codes and with what's happening, um, and and I've noticed that there's a lot of Lemurians and Atlanteans here right now in this process. And, <laughs> you know, you know, my my thoughts have been kind of that, you know, there were some maybe not as wise decisions made <laughs> in some of those times. Um, like you say, definitely the Lemurians with their healing energy, they were operating under very peaceful uh, vibrations, and they showed a great example uh, many long, long time ago <laughs> in their times. But I feel like a lot of them are back here now to help us not repeat our past, but to herald in that golden age, to herald in this stronger brainwave state that allows us to maintain uh, aspects in a stronger way, that allows us to uh, open these doors up to uh, realizing more of our immortality. I mean, there's the body, the skin is only a, a piece of, uh, you know, catalyst like a car in many ways, but um, I, as you say, I yeah, think and it's we a skin of energy too. those dimensions, <laughs> we realize that immortality that's existing. Yeah, no, I I, I agree. It's, it's it's interesting that you're seeing him because you know I wasn't even thinking about that, but I'm going back into some stuff that I've recorded in my brain, and I'm actually seeing that. Uh, it, it's it's interesting how um, you know you had I believe what I saw and of course there's all different parallel Earths and parallel solar systems and all of that kind of stuff so I won't say that it has to be the way that I put it in my book but in my book what I saw when I went back and re- remote viewed the timeline I was looking at I'm being specific here um, I saw. That there were, in Atlantis, the people from Lemuria went there, but you also had the Sumerians and the Anunnaki. And so, what happened was the Sumerians Anunnaki seemed to have the power right there. And I still don't, con- even though that planet uh, Nibiru or Marduk or Planet X is supposed to be in our solar system, I don't still don't find those people all that highly evolved as a people. I mean, there were some highly evolved personages there. But they were messing, they were, the Atlanteans were messing with the same stuff that they're doing with uh, the ELF generator up in Alaska, and Russia has one, and China has one, and India has one, and there might be other people that have them too. And they're doing all these kind of bizarre things that are messing with the ionosphere, and 
and they're sending signals into the ocean and doing different things that are causing the whales to beat themselves and, and, and all these kinds of different things. And and they were aerosoling their skies like what's been happening here right now. But we're starting to get – I have friends that uh, have actually used a certain organite technology from or, uh, Wilhelm Reich that actually – is starting to negate that stuff, and it's it's kind of exciting to actually see it happen. As the stuff is being sprayed in the sky, it's being reformed into clouds, whereas they would rather have it dispersed into something that would harm us. That it, we have the ability to like do that, but it, it looks like uh, I believe that the Atlantis. So the tale goes that Atlantis sank, and what I saw was there were. A couple earthquakes, big earthquakes, and then a big volcano went off, and it caused, uh, between the earthquakes and the volcano, there was a subduction of the planet. Now, you know, they found some cool things over there in Bimini. They found um, uh, megalithic stones, which means, I should define that, it means really big-sized blocks of like four and six and seven-foot dimensions and things like that. And they also found some stuff. Uh, off the coast of Spain, and then when the diving team went back there to investigate further, the Spanish government wouldn't let them, wouldn't give them a permit. So to me, that shows me they found something that was significant that would give us more knowledge. So you, you have these two forces. You have the forces of people like you and me and a lot of other people, not just you and me, but a lot of other people that – that are excited about learning as much thing as possible. And then you have this other force that, that doesn't want us to learn it. So we should just, for me, you know, we just simply have to uh, use our creativity. Actually, I w- I'm thinking of a way, but I'm not going to say it because I don't want the people to hear it, but I'm thinking of a way that those people could actually, those researchers could get back in there and actually research that area. So I'm going to try and contact them and suggest that, <laughs> they use my stealth approach to getting back in there. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, that, yeah, this would be this would be a good karmic wash having people come back to clean up the mess that they they created and the morphic fields that they created that would even allow people to be able to go and figure this stuff out and being able to do these these these. Um, these aberrant experiments and things like that. Uh, you know, I, th- I think that's an interesting th- way to put it, that it's in a way a kind of karmic wash because we don't always think about that happening with those from the so-called more evolved situ- um, civilizations, if you want to say that. But, you know, I noticed, too, one of the things with the Lemurians that uh, have shown up here particularly lately and are, are stepping out more, they're, you know, they're very frustrated, a lot of them, because they're used to operating in the spiritual way and not having to earn livings and things like that is, is required in these days and times to be here, um, you know, or, or to make life more comfortable for them uh, as they're used to. And they're having to really take a, a level of strength that they haven't had to do before. You know, and I think in their previous times of Lemuria, they could sit there on their their planet and do what they wanted to do. And, you know, there wasn't this whole money exchange and there wasn't, you know, all these having to stand your ground. Everybody was kind of accepted. And now this lifetime, they're having to stand strong and say, no, I'm going to share my light. I'm going to bring my work out. I'm going to heal, whether it's through music or whatever it is, singing roles or whatever it is, and, and um, you know, they're having to find a whole new strength in what they've ever had to deal with in the past. And I think this is a game changer in a lot of ways um, because I notice a lot of people that, that have incarnated from the area are very empathic and very sensitive to what's happening uh, right now. You know what I find exciting right now is that that just in the political process, which kind of disgusts me because I'm actually writing a book about this because I was starting to wonder if 
if uh, what's happening right now with all the name calling and all the slander and libel and all of these kind of things, I'm about maybe a third done with this book, but I'm going back into the past political elections and all this stuff was happening. They would call each other mulattoes. They would call each other. They would call each other's mothers a uh, whore. They might call uh, their wife prostitutes and all of these kind of things. But this stuff has been going on for a long time. But now people uh, in, in both of the major parties, they're basically the ones that are associated with uh, the, the burn and the ones that are associated with Trump. They're basically saying, hey, we're sick of the, the, the you making all these promises and telling us that you're working for us. Meanwhile, we're getting poorer by the day and everything. So it, it, this shows you this is, this is, you know, some weird things happen, how this thing plays out with the protesters and everything. But it, it shows, it's, it's proof that people are waking up. So it, it excites me that, that, that we, we, get the, we get the evidence that there's a shift going on. This shows you things are starting to change because these – and any major shift that's ever happened in every civilization happened with people speaking out, no longer like accepting what they were being told or accepting their plight in, in life anymore, you know. And right now, while well, we have huge disparity in wealth, it's so huge that it's astonishing. It's almost impossible for a mind to conceive it. But needless to say, there's you know there's there's all this difference. And so these people are basically saying, yeah, well, we should be sharing in the wealth too. And um, to me, well, this is what I'm right. This is kind of what I'm talking about. These kind of things. I'm talking about this all the time. But, the, and I know you understand this. I know you talk about this. I know you blog about this and kind of stuff is that, that there is enough for everybody. You know, uh, that's what Beyond the Mist of Time, that's what I was trying to show. That's what I'm trying to show on, on Planet of the Stupids, bringing the light of God back to planet Earth in a paradise found. And there's, 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 a, there's plenty of resources. There's enough food for everybody. There's enough energy. There's even enough of crappy gas, uh, although we have a lot better fuels that we can use than that. But there's, there's, there's no shortage. And so people are starting to see, yeah, yeah, well, you've been, you, you've been telling me a bunch of lies, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Are, are you, are you, are you kind of feeling and sensing that 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 change is going on in people's thoughts, and and that they're looking for something more than they were told was okay, and then they're finding out it's not working out too well for them. Well, I definitely think there's a lot of exposure to help us awaken to what what's real and what isn't real. You know, the, the veils are dropping, the illusions are dropping, and people are so used to being lied to in some ways. It's kind of like they've cried wolf for so long that nobody's <laughs> believing them anymore. And no matter what they say, even when they tell the truth, they're not believing them anymore. And I like you saying you know, that. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's really kind of where it's at in a sense. And, you know, they have programmed people to follow this false abundance, whether that is money or homes or whatever it is, and, you know, to be greedy and use more than what they need. If we're not in this greedy space, there's plenty there if we don't get greedy, if we don't waste things. Uh, and, yeah. and I think that that's a big, big piece of it. But if we tr- truly abundant, what's powerful is like using the 72 names of God where we can tune into what's truly abundant. And that is that light energy that you talked about when you first came on. And as we tune into that, there is that's completely limitless. And if we tune into that, we can create anything. We can Create vegetation to grow. Matter of fact, my, my friend was joking. She likes to use the word badass with me. And and um, <laughs> just today she goes, you're such a badass. And it, it's funny, but I, I don't know if I should be saying that on the air, but, you know, so it's funny because it, I, I've been traveling through these tornadoes, and I literally was involved standing on the edge of a tornado last night as I was coming out of Sioux Falls and I had hit Missouri City and the winds were rolling around and I'm being 
pummeled by these, I don't know whether it was hail or little stone pieces or whatever. And as soon as I pulled in this gas station to fuel up, because I'm like, I know I'm in all these tornado watches right now. I've got to, you know, make sure the tank is full in case i got to turn around or whatever. And, um, <laughs> you know, so I walk into the, the gas station and the, and the attendant there is like, man, that's the most bizarre thing. Here they were 10 minutes ago telling people that they've got to start thinking about taking cover and, you know, preparing, you know, for everything because uh, we've been under this huge watch and, and all of a sudden they just said there's no more watch. <laughs> and she says, I'm looking outside and can tell you there's a tornado that's going to touch down here. Well, I, and she said, what direction are you traveling? Because everybody was trying to share information right at the gas station. And uh, I said, well, I'm headed, you know, a little bit. She says, she says, everybody should be okay unless you're headed south. I said, well, I'm headed south, of course, <laughs> you know. And they're talking about 70-mile-per-hour winds and all of these things. And, uh, you know, so I just kind of said, okay, well, you're just going to have to get me through, and, you know, i got to head west. And, well, I went about 15 miles south, and then I headed west through Omaha, Nebraska, and, you know, of course, everything's sitting on the Nebraska border. I can see it off to my left as I'm driving down the highway, and the winds are, like, shifting the cars across the highway a little bit. You know, you, you can't drive straight completely because of the wind gusts. And, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, I'm you like, have to turn, I'm you have to turn the like wheel into the wind. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm at the edge of this tornado, and I just do what I normally do. And I say, well, if this is my time to go, then just make it peaceful and don't let me suffer, you know. And and it's all good. And and I accept that that's that's what it is. And I drive on, and I I keep turn, and I start to head west. And all of a sudden, everything is just peaceful and calm and beautiful, and you know, all these things. But you know, I'm taking all these messages, and then today. I'm driving in and I'm, I'm driving towards the Denver area and I've been out, in and out of all this weather and I go to this library that I'm at right now, nice space, you know, and, and I parked at the old space. I didn't realize they had moved to a new space and I, <laughs> I'm sitting in my car and it starts sailing and I'm like, okay, that's it. This isn't acceptable at all. <laughs> no hail can't do it. You can either hail later tonight or you can move the hail and go from <laughs> And well, I was looking at the weather map. It wasn't even a minute later, Robert, and the hail stopped. <laughs> and I told my friend about this. She goes, you are one badass. You make the hail stop. You, you shift the tornadoes around. <laughs> you remove well, the warnings on a moment's notice because that's where you are. And I said, that's right. I said, an angel is on the road tonight. There isn't going to be any trouble here. <laughs> That's really interesting because I was actually watching the map last night, and the middle of the United States was getting there was a bunch of there was a bunch of right. yellow and red cells moving up through there. So um, and right where I passed, after I passed through, it all moved right up to where I had been through, and I've been through this multiple times traveling the country. Um, but yeah, it's pretty pretty amusing to. See it, but it, as you say, it's it's about tapping into that abundance. You know, we have that abundance there, and the energy is abundant, and that's not going to go away. You know, it's just a what's, matter of uh, how to what's use that it. name for the power of what's that name of God for power of prosperity? There's a name for that. Oh, uh, oh, oh. Um, let's let's see here. I know, I know, I can pull, pull it up here. Uh, yeah. Power of Prosperity, Samat Aleph Lamed. Samat Aleph what? Lamed. Samat Aleph Lamed. Oh, Samat Aleph Lamed. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's interesting too because there was this book by who I consider probably the best psychic of modern times, and one of the reasons she's the best is because she never went out in the public. She just wrote books. Her name was Jane Roberts, and she wrote this book called <laughs> The Nature of Personal Reality, and her husband, Robert Butts, used to transcribe everything she did. She'd have a few people over at her house, and they'd do these sessions, and she talked about um, she, she talked about how how we create the weather and the calamities that happen on Earth, and I remember I, I, I asked my not deceased wife, I asked her, I said, I said, 
I said, can you? I said, that's loony. I don't believe that. Do you? And she says, yeah, it's true. You'll you'll figure it out eventually. <laughs> and so <laughs> I did figure it out eventually. <laughs> and uh, you know, you, you can you can change things. She she basically was saying is that the weather and the calamities are created by the mass thoughts of humanity. So if you don't want to be you basically took yourself out of the mass thought of humanity that created that situation, and you uncreated, you created a different timeline for yourself. And this is what I'm talking about. This exactly proves what I was talking about earlier. I love that you shared that. In that, in, in that, if we don't like the way things are going, we can create something different. We don't have to sit there and fret about it. You know, when when I found out about what the Illuminati was doing many years ago, I was just about ready to leave this planet. I even remember saying, thinking, why even waste the time doing it? And then I realized, well, I actually have a mission here, uh, and, and I think I need to stick around. Now I'm glad I did, uh, because I'm starting to see things change a little bit. I mean, I'm not exactly highly patient. A certain things I'm patient in, but a lot of things I'm not. I like to see results really quick because I'm used to creating, building things and planning things and different things like that and seeing quick results. So I just ex- I kind of expect it in everything. Um, but I remember also in, uh, in, in Level 2, a Kriya Kundalini Yoga uh, retreat where Yogi Govindan had us go out where where we went as a group and and then we went as a group and uh and he says we're going to dissolve clouds today and I'm going oh yeah right okay <laughs> well we went out there and sure enough that we did, we dissolved the clouds so we did that several times at several different re- retreats and then I was at like a I was at a I was at a at a blues festival and um my uh my girlfriend was getting cold and everything. It was all overcast. I said, how would you like it if I, I pierced a hole in the clouds so the sun could get through? And so so, so then I said, um, I said, and then I just concentrated on it, and it did. It happened. And, and, and little by little, all of this cover, this one little hole I made in it, it started expanding, and pretty soon there was, like, sun all over the place besides just on us. So... It's it's the intent that does it. Quantum mechanics has proven this beyond a doubt in the double slit experiment, where they showed that 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 if something was manifesting one way with no one observing it, or just just observing it with no um, no skin in the game, or no wanting any outcome, if they tr- if they actually saw a different outcome, this this these these beams of balls and everything would move in a different direction just as the people directed it. So um, that shows we have, that shows that we're not up the Creek without a paddle. That shows that we haven't been, we've been given all the terms the creator gave us, gave us everything we need and more. I don't even think we're even close to even perceiving what, you know, our, our potentials are individually and collectively as a society, but I've seen what it is possible by going back in time and looking at these really old civilizations. Uh, it it really and and I say, well, if they could do it, and they could do it tens of thousands, hundred thousands, or millions of years ago, then we could do the same thing. It's just that it's just that we have to to. Uh, get together, form a plan, and, and concentrate on it, and it'll happen. Well, and when we talk about these things, Robert, it just brings us back to what you were saying right there in the, the sense that um, you know, all the power is within us. It's not out here in all these earthly things, and we are limitless in what we can make happen when we learn how to use that. And, and it is just a process. You know, our time is winding down, so I'm going to let you share how people can connect with you, how they can contact you, and, okay. um, and we're going to have to start to wrap up here. But I, I'm so glad that you came back on the show because I just love spending time with you. Well, yeah, I want to get you on my show so we can extend the conversation <laughs> because um, – 
Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm uh, one of my websites is www. or dr. Robert Newton n e w t o n. dot com www. dot dr. Robert Newton. dot com. Another one is www. dot great motivational talks dot com. That's where I do the talks and do the counseling and stuff, all the way from personal relationships, sexuality, and all of these kind of things. Um, then. I'm also on LinkedIn as Dr. Robert J. Newton. I also have multiple pages on Facebook, um, Robert Newton, uh, Real Conspiracies with Scientific and Spiritual Solutions, Dr. Robert Newton, author. Um, And then I have uh, different pages for all my books, uh, Pathways to God, uh, A Map to Healing, uh, The Hidden Codes of God, uh, Beyond the Mist of Time and Trees Rule the Earth, uh, In Search of the Body Immortal, Planet of the Stupids, and the Immortality Prophecy, which, well, I'm really excited about because uh, I learned so much writing it, and this is this is something that I, this is my gift to humanity. I'm basically saying, do you want to be unlimited? Okay, I'm going to prove to you <laughs> with with not only old esoteric texts, but I'm going to show you scientifically how it's possible. So that should be out. All my books are also available on Amazon and Kindle and uh, soon probably through Lip Fire Publishing also. Awesome. That's that's absolutely incredible. And I would love to be on your show and continue <laughs> conversing with you and, and hoping I can connect up with you too in person soon. Um, well, I I'd like to um, I'd like to talk about your experiences when you were de- weren't you working with the police department or something like that or some for some investigations uh, or something? Yeah, yeah. About a year and a half ago, I was doing some work with the um, police departments on cold crime cases. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. So. Yeah. It'll be a lot of fun. Well, thank you again for showing up. And if anything, by the way, cuts off to our listeners. Uh, in the process of this show as we're closing out, just know it will be there in the archives, even if it cuts you off on the live version right now. <laughs> so I just want to, you know, reinforce that to people there. But such a uh, pleasure. On Talk, yeah. it'll be right up, right? It gets archived really fast, right? Yeah, yeah. The archives will be available immediately after we finish here. So if you know somebody that'd like to jump in and listen to the show or if anybody has missed any piece of the show, they can certainly um, go in and catch it pretty much right away on there. I find every now and then it takes a little bit of time if I'm downloading it, but if I'm just going in to listen, it's right there. So um, that's a, a great well, thing. I, I appreciate you having me on the show, and I'm uh, <laughs> I'm sorry I got mixed up on the time zone, but <laughs> I did call you up that one time when your guest book <laughs> and helped you fill an hour. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. It was awesome. You 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 really helped me out that one time too, and it was. Well, great. I can feel a need, so I'm not gonna let someone hang. <laughs> I I said there's something going on, and and I figured he's out there in the universe. The time slipped away because <laughs> I know you well enough to know, and I'm like that too. I get into those trance spaces, and then it's like, Whoo, where does the time go? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because maybe there is no time, huh? <laughs> <laughs> There's more time, right, exactly. So next week on the show, what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be doing my own show on dreams, taking a look at what the codes say about the dreams that we have and delving into some of those common dream themes that we, we tend to experience in the dream state. Don't forget that, uh, again, I am a collaborator on the international bestseller, um, Embraced by the Divine, the Emerging Woman's Gateway to Power, Passion, and Purpose. And that can be uh, accessed, and you can find out more information about that at embracedbythedivine.com. You can also check out um, all of the work that I've been doing from my codes to my monthly video tips and archive shows and interviews. And, you know, we had a great interview with Dr. Robert Newton, like I said, about three years ago. And you can go back and catch the archives on that, monthly specials, the whole work on my website, Jesse Ann Nichols George and number one.com. And then I do want to remind you that May's special deal, there's still a few days to take advantage of it, and that is if you purchase the ebook version of either Activating Compassion or You Need Life and Dreams, 
and it's a company, uh, you'll get the accompanying workbook absolutely free. You just got to send me the receipt on that. And then um, I also, I, I also want to mention that we do have several shows here on Main Street Universe. And um, one of the key shows that we have every Tuesday nights is Susan Reed, who does work in herbs and natural plants. Um, great half-hour show there. Uh, Wednesday nights, oftentimes, we have Daniel and Denise on doing the flagship show. Darren Bucare comes in about once a month with the spiritual insights. So all kinds of great things happening here on the network. This is Jesse Ann Nichols George, and I am so glad that you joined me here today. And thanks to all of our listeners, not only on Blog Talk Radio, but those also streaming live on Penn known as Pair Encounters Network. Stream Finder, Talk Stream Live, and those catching our podcast at iTunes, TuneIn.com, and those catching the YouTube version of the show. Don't forget that if you've enjoyed the show today, share it with others. It's going to be available at the same link in our archives. And I'm going to leave you today with the song Yearning For, also known as Over and Over. It's by Shemshai. And again, you can catch up with all the work that they're doing through their website, www.shemshai.com. That's S-H-I-M-S-H-A-I.com. May you enjoy the rest of the weekend and have an amazing week. And if I could see what makes me blind, I would soar to the edge of my mind. And to touch what seems unreal, just to show you the way that I feel. And we are in time with time, one with Season of change inside And we are in tune with the tune Caught in a balance of sun and moon Oh, deep inside The light within Shining to show you It's here to begin When all I have To the edge of eternity And we see in eye to eye One within love to be for the divine And we're walking hand in hand Caught in the balance of God and Learning to walk just a little bit slower Whispering secrets I bet you can't keep it No turning back now This time we reveal it Once you are another All will discover The essence within The most beautiful lover Time is still turning The love is still burning Deep in your spirit Your heart still yearning Now this time we reveal it Once you 
Yes, it's within the most beautiful love. 